very much. So it is my pleasure to co-moderate this session with very famous people, Professor Adolfo Garcia Sastre and Professor Eduardo Fernandez Cruz. It's going to be a, a long session, very good presentations. I think I would suggest I can introduce the first two speakers. Uh, and then uh, maybe Adolfo, if you agree, you can introduce the two second ones. And then uh, Eduardo could introduce the special lecture, uh, Johnson, Johnson and Johnson. Okay. He, can you hear me well? Yes. Okay. So uh, I will be very brief with the presentations because we are a little late in the schedule. So the, the first speaker will be Professor Eduardo Fernandez Cruz. He's a very important scientist and professor teaching in the university and doing research. And he will be speaking on the development of an effective protective community immunity to the pandemic virus sars coronavirus 2 So please, Eduardo, whenever you like. Thank you very much, Luis. Uh, I'm going to present the current scientific data on immunity against coronavirus SARS-CoV-2. Next. First, we will review what we know about SARS-CoV-2 neutralization, targeting, discovering, conserved antigenic sites in spike glycoprotein. As you know, SARS-CoV-2 spike glycoprotein promotes entry into host cells through high affinity uh, binding to AC2 receptor and is the main target on neutralizing antibodies. And is with this high affinity that this binding occurs and um, um, contributes to the current rapid transmission of SARS-CoV-2 -CoV that we are observing in humans in all regions of the world. There are currently um, different manufacturers. Uh, we just uh, were listening to one of, of those, uh, Nathan Roth cell bearing, and other lilies and so on, that uh, are the, uh, in the development of monoclonal antibodies. Uh, monoclonal antibodies uh, that we are going to, to comment on are those against the SARS-CoV-2 spike glycoprotein uh, and, and, the, and were obtained from B cells from SARS-CoV uh, from uh, uh, 2003. Next. It has been identified uh, uh, one monoclonal antibody SCO9 uh, engaging the receptor binding domain uh, of S glycoprotein that with high affinity could neutralize potently SARS-CoV and SARS-CoV2 viruses. This monoclonal antibody recognizes a glycan, uh, an epitope that is conserved in SARS-CoV and SARS-CoV2 spike glycoproteins, which share an 80% amino acid sequence. Identity um, belongs to coronavirus sarvecovirus subgenus, which includes SARS-CoV, SARS-CoV-2, and SARS-like bad cov The analysis of course neutralizing antibody with monoclonal antibodies from B cells from SARS-CoV reveals a lack of cross reactivity outside the sarvecovirus subgenus, such as the MERS or the common cold coronaviruses. Analysis indicate that broad neutralizing antibody activity of human antibody against multiple SARS-CoV-2, uh, including SARS-CoV and SARS-CoV-2, occurs via recognition of this highly conserved epitope uh, co that comprises glycan. 
monoclonal antibodies can also recruit next effect on mechanisms which can mitigate the risk of viral escape from the immune system of the host. Next, please. Those, no. That's it. Those effector mechanisms of neutralization or of, of neutralizing antibodies can contribute to viral control in individuals infected uh, with, uh, with virus and include the IgG fat fragment binding. Next. The IgG fat uh, binding, uh, the glycoprotein timer, the ADCC antibody dependent cells cytotoxicity by NK cells, and the ADCP antibody dependent cellular phagocytosis by APC. However, those uh, have a, a, a adverse effects uh, is the risk of antibody dependent disease enhancement, uh, which may be induced by weakly neutralizing antibodies, which might potentially be generated either by vaccination or by infection. The strategy of using monoclonal antibodies uh, included uh, the discovering of concept epitopes. Uh, that could define potential antigenic sites to include in vaccine design or uh, for monoclonal antibody therapy using antibody cocktails, uh, mix uh, um, uh, neutralizing antibody recognizing a, a conserved epitope and other weakly neutralizing antibodies, which will be enhanced by the other a, a, a monoclonal antibody and could be used in prophylaxis for high risk of exposure or as post exposure therapy. These uh, we may have in, in, in prior studies uh, with uh, ansuvimab monoclonal antibody that have been shown to be safe and effective treatment for Ebola. Next. There is cross immunity between respiratory coronavirus. We have seven coronavirus that produce disease in humans. Three are pandemic, beta, uh, produce the SARS, MERS, SARS-CoV, and SARS-CoV-2. And the, the other are four, alpha and beta, that are the common cause. They produce upper or lower respiratory tract infections, targeting elderly or immunocompromised. Uh, and those are the uh, those uh, common core monoclonal antibodies. The seven cores have something very important that is they share significant synchronomology and potentially conserve antigenic epitopes capable of inducing a cross-reacted adapted immune response, producing neutralizing antibodies and this degree of similarity could make that previous exposure to one coronavirus could confer immunity to another due to cross reactivity in the host. We will deal with this uh, uh, issue uh, um, later on. Next. I have included this figure because I know that you will feel more relaxed. Although just momentarily since uh, this is an illustration of a T-lymphocyte cell targeting coronavirus particles. And, uh, and however, uh, we know that, uh, that there are very complex issues uh, that still we don't understand in relation with the cell-mediated immunity. Next. Um, we know the neutralizing antibodies are poorly detected in COVID-19 patients, especially in those with less severe forms of SARS-CoV-2 infection. And some data has been presented already on that. Data from coronavirus studies show that memory B cell responses have shorter duration after infection than memory T cell responses. 
which can persist for longer period of time. However, uh, the infection with subcoptos disturbs functionally the innate immune response, which eventually leads to perturbation of the development of the adaptive T cell response. Next. There are uh, recent studies showing markers of functional CD4 and CD8 T cells which are associated to immunity in COVID-19. But uh, uh, next. Uh, there are uh, critical uh, uh, difference between uh, uh, the phenotype of those cells that might influence the outcome of the clinical response. Uh, it has been shown that in patients with acute, moderate, or severe COVID-19, uh, uh, there is an expression of markers associated with functional alteration of the T-cell compartment, which includes immune activation molecules like CD38, uh, regulatory inhibitory receptors like uh, PD1, or cytokine molecules like granzyme or perforin. Um, however, convalescent uh, um, individuals with a history of asymptomatic or mild uh, or non-exposed healthy donors show uh, polyfunctional, polyfunctional SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, specific TC4, TD, TCD4 or TCD8 effector central memory phenotype and markers of uh, differentiation, like uh, the CCR7, CD127, CD107. Uh, and, and this is a phenotype of a physiological phenotype and phenotype associated with recovery uh, and, and with immunity. And, 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 and this is uh, associated to um, Abraham phenotype that uh, for the immune activation uh, and, 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 um, and in induction of markers of inflammation like uh, IL-1 beta, TNL alpha, IL-10. Uh, and this is, we know, associated to disease severity. Also, there is a correlation uh, of those markers uh, with uh, uh, antibody response. So the, uh, we can find here uh, in parallel SARS-CoV-2 IgG levels. Next. On the basis of the current information, uh, we, we might uh, uh, ask ourselves whether adapted immune response to SARS uh, are protected or pathogenic. Uh, T cell immune response against SARS CoV 2 infection uh, develops in COVID 19 patients, uh, but uh, it depends on the phase of the infection, the magnitude of the levels of RNA uh, uh, of SARS-CoV-2, the cytokine polarization, TH1 or TH2, uh, uh, and other inflammatory response stimulated by specific epitopes recognized by SARS-CoV-2, they are going to determine uh, the, the, the outcome of the, of the clinical response. Next. So we, we could consider two propositions. A basic concept uh, where uh, we can uh, assume that based on studies from most closely related human beta coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, uh, uh, SARS-CoV and MERS 
natural infection with SARS-CoV-2 elicits potent CD4 and CD8 T cell and neutralizing antibody responses, which could be associated with long-term protected immunity to COVID-19. This has been observed, and there are studies now ongoing to confirm this concept. But also we could consider the contrarian viewpoint. Available data for human coronavirus suggests the possibility that adaptive immune response can fail to occur, fail to occur, due to a T cell and or antibody response of insufficient magnitude or durability, or with aberrant uh, phenotype. After entering the host cell, the virus SARS-CoV-2 excess an evasion of the innate immune response, which will exacerbate the perturbations in CD4 T cells and in antigen presenting cells and macrophages uh, with induction of inflammatory cytokine and chemokine responses which are mechanisms of immunopathogenesis uh, in COVID-19 patients, which uh, at the end will be deleterious to the health of the patient. Next. Uh, finally, uh, summarizing, uh, there is some degree of evidence in favor of pre-existing immunity to coronavirus in the human population. Pre-existing T cell reactivities to SARS-CoV-2 epitopes observed in non-exposed individuals may be related to the mitigation of the outcome of the infection. Lower viral low, higher T cell antiviral immunity, and less morbidity and mortality. Identification of course neutralizing activity with other beta coronavirus subgenera Sarvecovirus, SARS CoV, SARS CoV 2, against SARS CoV 2 in currently available intravenous immunoglobulin, such as uh, Flebogamma DIF. Uh, uh, this is very uh, interesting in the, the plasma obtained. Uh, to produce this IVVIG were from donors in US, in Europe from March uh, 2018 and October 2019. Uh, other observation uh, is the protected immunity uh, that can be observed in close reactive CD4 T cells um, in various models like SARS mouse models and even in other pandemic viruses like H1N1 human influenza flu pandemic. Next and final. It is hypothesized that unexposed donors who show antibody cell reactivity to common cold coronavirus could have associated pre-existing pan-coronavirus T cells capable of recognizing SARS-CoV-2 epitopes. In fact, in convalescent COVID-19 and non-exposed individuals or, or family non-infected from, uh, from uh, COVID-19 patients uh, show that SARS-CoV-2 specific T cells are cross-reacted with concerned peptides with high degree of sequence homology from other human beta coronavirus. And, and I must say those are very complex uh, experiments using uh, technology uh, with uh, mega pools, the broad-based uh, uh, epitopes, uh, but very important, it, it, they are giving us a lot of insight in this area. Finally, if some degree of cross-reactivity or cross-reactive coronavirus immunity has been observed in the human population, uh, there is hope for some influence on the course 
or the infectivity of SARS-CoV-2, uh, like it seems that it might occur in different regions of the world, and it may impact in the future dynamic of the epidemiology of the pandemic. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Eduardo, for this interesting and provocative presentation. I think because we are out of a schedule, we should proceed now with the other presentations. And then at the end, in the round table, we can come back to questions for everyone. Now it is my pleasure to present to Adolfo Garcia Sastre. He needs no presentation because he's a top world leader in the field of viral immunology mostly with influenza virus, but not restricted to this virus. He can cope with many things because I know he does not sleep at night. As he told me, he only sleeps when he remembers, but he stays awake most of the time. So Adolfo is director of the Global Health and Emerging Pathogens Institute and professor of the Ikan School of Medicine, Mount Sinai in New York. And he will be talking to us about new challenges in the development of vaccines for emerging viruses. Adolfo, the stage is yours. Okay, thanks a lot, Luis. Um, again, a pleasure to be here. And I have only a few slides, which are mainly to, to initiate also debate um, and the, the challenges for development of vaccines against emerging viruses. I have focused on SARS coronavirus too, because obviously this is an emerging virus. Um, okay, so let's see if I get control of my screen. All right, so the first slide just illustrate what is the useful path to a vaccine. And uh, unfortunately, the useful path for a vaccine is extremely slow. So vaccines takes for development around 15 years, if not more, uh, with many years first of exploratory preclinical studies, finding the antigen, the platform, uh, the studies conducting animal models still, uh, finally, an IND is submitted for conducting uh, phase one studies, which takes around one to two years to get the, to get the data that are required then to get uh, a start in phase two studies. And if one is lucky, two years later after phase two study, one find the way how to fund phase three studies, which still take two to three years, for finally submitting um, the results for the BLA. And then the results have been looked at the regulatory issues, review it very carefully. This review takes also between one to two years. And then finally, you have the approval of the vaccine, if we are lucky. And then after that, we need to start the large scale production and distribution of the vaccine, which also takes time. So it's a very, very lengthy process. Now, uh, obviously, this is, um, if we use this same strategy, that will be a disaster for trying to contain COVID-19 through vaccination. So now the vaccine has process of testing vaccine has been accelerated. This doesn't mean that one is taking away shortcuts, things that you should do in order to compromise safety, or is that everything is being compressed very quickly in the, in the minimal amount of time needed in order to know for sure whether we have safe vaccines and efficacious vaccines. Uh, so for example, the preclinical studies have been combined together with the phase one studies. Uh, everything is, is, a lot of the data are based already in data that we knew from uh, SARS coronavirus, the previous one of with MERS, and then phase one and two and three studies, they become to be overlapped in order to be able to obtain results very quickly. The production is being, uh, is being conducted at risk before we know that the vaccines are working. Production starts in order that if at the end we know that the vaccine is working, we have already some produced uh, vaccines that can start to be distributed. And the regulatory review also is started, is it tried to be more accelerated. So we try to compress all these 15 years that took to take a normal vaccine into, into humans into a, a, a period that is between two, 10 months to 1.5 years in order to see the vaccines against COVID-19. But still, there are many issues that we need to keep in mind. Um, first, some of the front runners have never produced a licensed vaccine. That's the case, for example, of Moderna 
or the technology that is used has never been used for licensing licensed vaccines before. Basically, all the front runners have completely new technologies, that perhaps Sinovac, which is an activated vaccine. And therefore, it's unclear how easy are all these new technologies to be adapted to large scale production for the number of doses that we require. So even if these vaccines are successful, they still may have troubles with the manufacturing that needs to be needed to produce the number of doses that are needed. Distribution is, is not is also something that needs to be taken in care because it takes time and it's a challenge for a large number of doses. And administration, we need to decide who will get the vaccine first and what type of campaigns we are doing in order to especially convince people that if we have a vaccine that is safe and efficacious, that they should get vaccinated in order to be able to stop this pandemic. And then finally, in terms of immunity, we need to take in mind that it takes time to zero convert. So it's not that you get vaccinated and now you are protected. And it's not clear if booster doses are needed as the initial vaccination and in the booster dose is, is needed, which most of the clinical trials, they use boostings, then it takes, takes even more time in order to get uh, the protective immunity that you need to, to have. Globally, we need 16 billion doses. So this is this is not a, a, a small number. And that's, that's what we would like to go, right, for 16 billion doses of vaccine. Um, the ideal vaccine will, will be the one that provides long-lasting protection against infection in single shot in all groups. And we are not going to get the ideal vaccine, this is clear. But even a vaccine that provides short-time partial protection against disease after several shots will be of great help right now because it will reduce the number of infections if people are using it to a point that may be already manageable through the normal um, life that, that we normally have in order to contain some infectious diseases. And then we need also to have in mind that protection in the elderly by vaccination has been always been very difficult and the elderly are one of the major risk groups for COVID-19. Now, this might not be a major issue if the vaccine provides protection from infection and not transmission in the rest of the population and it's been used in the rest of the population because it may create herd immunity that is required for preventing the virus to get into large amounts in, and inducing large amount of, of disease in the elderly. But that's something that needs to be seen. Um, now, we know also we have in the past some problematic vaccines and that's why we need to make sure that there is no side uh, adverse events associated with any of the vaccines that have been uh, under consideration. We know uh, that children vaccinated with inactivated RSV vaccine not only were not protected, but they have enhanced disease after infection with RSV due to the wrong TH1, TH2 type of, of immunity induced by the vaccine. Uh, in the case of swine influenza vaccination in the 70s for a vaccine that was done in the United States, thinking that it was coming the next pandemic of influenza, there was a lot of people that got vaccinated with this with the vaccine. And there were several cases of Guillain-Barré syndrome, which is a very severe neurological um, disease that has been associated with this specific vaccine. Uh, that's something that we would like also to know in the vaccines that are being now tested, that they don't uh, give rise to these severe adverse events, even if there are only a few cases, the ones that are occurring. And then finally, we have also the problem of potential antibody dependent enhancement that occurs with some diseases. That has been the case with dengue virus uh, vaccinated uh, kids, uh, vaccinated with, with a dengue virus vaccine, in which case there was antibody dependent enhancement. We don't think that there is uh, antibody dependent enhancement for this SARS coronavirus 2, but we cannot exclude completely that that's the case. And that's something that we need also to monitor. Uh, so finally, that's my final um, slide. Uh, where are we now? Um, so we have heard already um, uh, talks about the vaccines. They are the first phase one, two results, that is the ones that have been published are promising. All the vaccines have been able to induce neutralizing antibodies in serum volunteers without any case at this small number of, of people of severe adverse events. And the phase, phase three trials are have started and they are ongoing. Uh, there are many other vaccines in addition to the front runners that are entering also clinical studies. So we have backup in case that some of the front runners are not providing enough effective immunity. But there are many still remaining questions. We still don't know what are the levels of antibodies in SIRA that are protective. Can we have a correlate of protection based on antibodies in SIRA? That would be very easy to measure. How about mucosal immunity? To what uh, instance this is required for, for this disease? Most of the vaccines are being administered intramuscularly, and this in general does not result in a good mucosal immunity. So if this is required for getting an effective vaccine, 
uh, there are not so many vaccines that are being done that are not intramuscular. Uh, phase three clinical trials, we are depending that in the places where the phase three clinical trials are being conducted, there is enough number of infections to be able to find quickly whether the vaccine people, the vaccinated people uh, group are protected against infection and or disease versus the non-vaccinated. If there is very little number of infections in the places where phase three trials are being conducted, then it takes longer to find out whether the vaccine effect is effective or not. Uh, how quickly to manufacture the number of doses required and who should be the first priority groups of immunization, like I, like I mentioned also before. And then finally, acceptance. How is going to be the acceptance of a vaccine? Because obviously, in order for a vaccine to work, not only needs to be effective, but it also needs to be used. And if it's not used, the vaccine will not work. And this is also one of the challenges in, in the vac development of vaccines for this COVID-19. And um, I will stop here and then uh, we will continue with the with uh, the uh, presentations. So I think uh, if uh, following with the program, I think the next speaker I'm going to be presenting, uh, Dr. Luis and Juanes, and it's my pleasure to present uh, Dr. And Juanes, a good friend and a good colleague for many years. Uh, Dr. And Juanes is, is professor at the National Center of Biotechnology, um, and has been uh, a forefront in virology. Uh, he has been the leader in coronaviruses for many years, trying to understand how these viruses, both animal and human viruses, cause disease, uh, what is the mechanism of evolution, what is the molecular biology, the virulence factors, potential vaccines against them. And he's been recognized as one of the major experts uh, for many years in coronavirus. And, and we basically need people like him and his group in order to understand uh, how these viruses cause disease. And a lot of has been advanced before uh, sars cov virus 2 came, thanks to, uh, among things, the, the results that got from his lab. And I should mention also has been the first one to develop a reverse genetics technique for coronaviruses, which, uh, which uh, um, again, is, uh, is, uh, is, is a big, uh, um, um, challenge for these viruses and allows them now to understand them better and perhaps also to make vaccines. So, so Luis, uh, make sure that you are in the English channel um, yeah, in order for you to be seen. And without any other more delay, um, the, the presentation is now for you to, 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 to share the slides, but I think you have to do it. Okay, you can hear me and you see the slides, correct? Yes, and I and I think you need to click in the in the screen in order to get the command on the slides and being able to pass. Uh, I did it. I am I am not with the large screen. Maybe I should I should move to the to the large screen. Okay. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So there are many coronaviruses. All of them infecting human beings domestic animals, wild animals, bats, and chickens, they are coming from bats. But the problem we have is that those bats are flying all over all continents, and that will guarantee that we will have new epidemics for humans and animals in the near future. So we, we better find a, the, a good basis for, for a new vaccine. Uh, are, today, we know seven human coronaviruses. Four of them are known basically from the 50s and 60s, and by now they are all attenuated. And three other in red, SARS, MERS, and SARS coronavirus 2, they are deadly for, for human beings. And this uh, SARS coronavirus 2 that appeared in 2019 uh, has a collection of very bad issues. The, one of the first for me is that it causes asymptomatic infection during, frequently during 14 days, and therefore it can run away and we don't notice and can disseminate very fast. Uh, another terrible issue of this virus is that he has incorporated to his spike protein a small piece of, uh, of the protein and that carries a, a, a cleavage by furing in a, a protease, and that activates the spike protein such a way that is prepared to infect almost any tissue. That has increased tremendously the possibility to the virus, 
to infect many organs in contrast to SARS-1 that basically was infecting only the respiratory and the enteric tract. So that has been, this incorporation of the furin cleavage site has been terrible. Also, it's, it looks in general that it induces a limited immune response. It induces both uh, T cells and B cell responses, but they don't last too much from what we know for the moment. And another terrible thing is that uh, the emergency in apparently recovered patients of the virus suggesting that the immune response that they have is, is very weak. Okay, so in contrast to SARS coronavirus 1, SARS coronavirus 2, 2 induce many pathologies affecting many organs, lungs, gut, kidney, brain, head, veins, it causes COVID-2, strokes, ischemic bowel, causes smell of loss, uh, flavor, and pancreas in severe disease. So, this is not what we were expecting for a standard coronavirus. Now, when the virus is binding the cell through the receptor, the spike protein has to be activated. And for an efficient infection, it needs two proteolytic cleavages. This is the spike protein, a summary, and it has to suffer cleavage in this position, about in the middle of the protein, between S1, S2 domains, and then a second cleavage that is in the S2 prima position. So these two positions are in this side. And the problem is that the, the first cleavage does not need to happen in SARS coronavirus 2 by external uh, uh, proteases because the the, the, the peptide that has incorporated in the spike protein, it comes out already clear from the infected cells. And then the second cleavage is essential for the infection to proceed, but there are two proteases, TMP, RSS2, or catepsin less frequently. Mm, the virus, as I am saying, suffers a uh, uh, cleavage inside one, S1, S2 in infected cells. So when the virus is proceeding through uh, the Golgi, the cleavage takes place, and when it comes out, it's already activated. So it can enter by endocytosis, and then the second cleavage will, will take place. Now, the problem is that these four amino acids that constitute the new cleavage site is the terrible addition of this virus. And this virus, when it replicates in tissue culture in cells, can lose this cleavage site. There are deletions like this, outlined by these white domains, in, that remove the cleavage site, or even outside, uh, to the uh, in, in terminus of this cleavage site, and that changes the life of the virus. And in in tissue culture, it becomes more efficient for the replication, whereas in vivo is not imposed the the cleave virus. It still, is selected the one that carries this this site. So there are many strategies to protect against virus infections many ways to make vaccines. The simple ones when we uh, are in rush are uh, the inactivated vaccines, but those vaccines, they uh, induce low lactogenic immunity, which is the one that we need to protect in the, in the lungs, and they induce a non-lasting memory cells. Furthermore, frequently inactivated vaccines, they induce problems later on, they can induce eosinophilia and antibody-dependent enhancement of the infectivity. A much better life attenuated vaccines because they mimic the natural route of infection. They are highly immunogenic. They induce long-lasting memory, but they have a problem too. The re potential reversion to virulence is possible. So, to make an inactivated vaccine is relatively easy. You can purify the virus as we did many years ago, 
purifying this coronavirus can be chemically inactivated and you have a vaccine. But the danger is that we know that can induce this secondary effect, the eosinophilia, which we don't want. We can purify the spike protein, the spikes that surrounds the surface of the virus as we did more than 50 years ago with one coronavirus. Those spikes, when they detach from the virus, they can self-aggregate and form oligomers of the tri of trimers. This is a, a very powerful antigen. And this apparently does not induce so much eosinophilia reaction and can be a safe antigens, antigen for protection because it induces lots of neutralizing antibodies, providing that, that you use the correct adjuvant to prevent the secondary unwanted reactions. In our lab, we wanted to prepare safe viruses. And but for that, we study the molecular basis of virulence because the, the virus, viruses don't kill people because they grow very well. They kill people if they have genes involving virulences, in virulences. If we identify those genes and remove them, the virus attenuates, and this is a vaccine candidate. And the other tool that we need for this development is to machinery to replicate. If we identify signaling pathways that are involved in the viral replication, we can look for drugs that will inhibit those signaling pathways, and then we will identify antivirals. So to do our work, we needed to generate an infectious CDNA clone that will allow us to engineer the virus, to identify uh, the genes responsible for virus virulence by deleting one by one those, those genes, and also to develop animal models to do the testing. Of course, you need to work under safety conditions. And we made a similar observation long time ago. That was in 2003, when we were working with such coronavirus one. These coronaviruses, they have many proteins, but in the surface, they have mainly the spike protein and the envelope protein. This envelope protein is very small, but is highly abundant in the infected cells. As you can see, when we use antibodies specific for N protein, the whole cytoplasm tends green because E protein is highly abundant. But the important seminal observation was that when we deleted this protein, we realized that if we were infecting with the white type virus with the E protein, at four and six days post infection, we could see high infiltration and lung edema causing death. Whereas when we removed the E protein, the lungs were clear and functional. When we use this delete E deleted virus as a vaccine candidate and we infected mice, and three, month, three weeks later, we did a challenge to see whether they were protected. We saw that the non infected mice, the black line, were losing weight very fast, and soon then they, all of them were dead. The survival was zero by day four post challenge. In contrast, the one, the mice vaccinated with this E protein deleted virus, they did not lose weight and survival was 100%. This observation was done, was done with SARS coronavirus 1, year 2003, but then we can reproduce that with SARS with MERS coronavirus. When we delete E protein also from, from this virus, we made an interesting observation the virus will disappear when we pass the virus in tissue culture. By passage two, it, it was gone, meaning that it could Whereas when we analyze replication in the next box, we could see that the wild type virus could replicate very well the blue columns, both the genome and the subgenomic RNAs, whereas the virus missing E protein could replicate even better than the wild type virus. But as I said before, it 
could not disseminate. Therefore, we had isolate a replication competent propagation deficient virus. But there are many more genes that we study in this MERS coronavirus. My talk will be focused on MERS coronavirus. We have done basically the same thing with SARS coronavirus too, but some of the data at this moment is confidential, and I will just point some results at the end of my talk as time permits. There are other genes that we were deleting one by one, and we realized that by deleting gene 4A and 4B, by deleting each one of those genes, the virus will be attenuated. So we decided to delete those genes in addition to E gene plus two other ones, because those genes are non-essential for viral replication. So the virus can be amplified, but the virus resulting from those deletions will be attenuated and propagation deficient thanks to E protein. Therefore, this will be a, a safe vaccine candidate because the virus cannot move from cell to cell. When we analyze the protection by this virus with several deletions, we realize in a challenge experiment that immunized uh, mice will not lose weight after the challenge and 100% of them will survive. Whereas those that have not been vaccinated, they rapidly lost weight and by day seven post-infection survival was zero. So that was in principle a vaccine candidate. We made a, a specific, what we call RNA replicon. We cannot call what we engineered a virus because it's not able to disseminate. Therefore, he will not have the chance to go back to a virulent form. And when we study whether in fact this virus was propagation deficient, we compare the propagation of the, of the wild type virus in black columns. As you can say, at three and six days post infection, the virus can grow very well. <coughs> in contrast, the RNA replicon that we have generated by deleting five genes, it does not replicate at days three or six, indicating that it was dissemination uh, deficient. The interesting point is that. When we use electron microscopy to analyze the particles that were generated in the cells by the white type virus or by the virus in which E protein was deleted, in both cases, we could see inside vesicles viral, viral particles. These are the standard white type viral particles, but these are the, wild, the viral particles that are formed in the absence of, of E protein. Those viral particles they cannot disseminate, but they can replicate and amplify. In fact, when we take these virus missing five genes and why we analyze viral replication of the replicon in orange in comparison with the white type virus in black, both can make the genome and both can make subgenomic RNAs because both can transcribe, even at high levels. Therefore, we had a vaccine candidate. We wanted to see whether these viruses in which we deleted five genes were attenuated, and in fact, that was the case. If we infect the mice with the wild type virus, they rapidly will lose weight, and by day eight, survival will be zero. But with any of the other deletion mutants that we engineer, they don't lose weight, and survival was 100%. Therefore, that indicated that it was a safe virus. Then we used they, this vaccine candidate to immunize mice. And again, non-immunized mice, when we challenge them, they rapidly lose weight. And by day seven, all of them are dead. Whereas those vaccinated, they don't lose weight, they even win weight and survival is 100%. Therefore, that look a very good vaccine candidate. Interestingly, when we try to follow what happens after immunizing mice and then performing the challenge of those mice with a highly virulent virus, and we follow at days two, four, and six virus production in non-immunized mice, black columns, or in those mice that were vaccinated with this vaccine candidate, 
in orange, as you can see in the vaccinated mice, we were not able to detect infectious virus at any time. So the, the strength of the vaccination was so high that when we inject those mice with a highly virulent virus, this virus does not have the chance to grow. It is what is called sterilizing immunity. This is a property that most of the vaccine, almost all, I know one exception, uh, they, they can protect from disease, they can protect from death, but they do not induce sterilizing immunity because they allow the virus to grow for some time. So now we are busy with the uh, engineering of two versions of our vaccine candidate. One is what we call a chemically synthesized version in which we introduce this RNA replicon that we have engineered by the deletion of five genes and we mix it with a cationic polymer for nanoparticles and we use those nanoparticles for immunization. Everything is synthetic. In another version, as I showed you before, when we use the, the replicon uh, in transfect cells, they form BLPs, but those BLPs cannot propagate. And this is good for safety, but we can provide in the vaccine factory one of the proteins that is key for uh, uh, this uh, lack of propagation. But in the vaccine factory, we can provide this protein and then we can complement the RNA replicon and those VLPs could propagate in the vaccine company and produce large amounts of virus-like particles that are polymeric and should be highly immunogenic. Well, that's a problem with the slide, but all this work that has been done before with MERS coronavirus proving that we can protect has been reproduced now in our lab for SARS coronavirus 2. We engineered a full-length infectious CDNA clone. Once we had this clone, we engineer many deletion mutants. Here I show just 10, but we have engineered engineer more than 20 to identify the perfect combination in order to remove genes potentially involved in virulence and genes that are also involved in the propagation of the virus. We, and we know now that we have already engineered uh, SARS coronavirus 2, that is dissemination incompetent. It cannot propagate, but is replication competent. That means it can be self-amplified. I think because we are late in the schedule, I will escape the presentation of how we have addressed the issue of antivirals, but we are a little late in the schedule. And I think I will turn the word to Adolfo after I point out uh, some of my colleagues uh, if if I can stop the slide on time. Okay. Uh, oh. I want to thank mainly to Jose Manuel Onrubia and Alejandro Sanz and uh, Javier Gutierrez from my lab. Uh, Sonia is a long-term collaborator and uh, Isabel Sola, who is the co-director of the lab. And also we thank very much the collaboration with very bright scientists from the United States, from the University of Iowa, Stanley Perman and Paul McRae, to Beren Bosch and Bar Hamann with the work with more coronal antibodies. And of course, to Adolfo Garcia Sastre, which is a fantastic scientist, but no more than that, he's a fantastic person too. So thank you, Adolfo. I turn the word to you in case you want to introduce the next speaker. Thank you, Luis. Um, we actually have only one more speaker according to the schedule. Uh, so perhaps I give the chance to Eduardo to present him. Mm, I think so. Eduardo, are you ready? I thought we had, uh, yeah, it's only one more. Yes. Yeah, it's mm. only one more. It's Dr. Sepper. Uh, do you want to present Eduardo Gershipper? Well, uh, yeah, uh, let me introduce you to uh, Jed Shepard, uh, that um, I have uh, uh, reviewed his curricula, and he's uh, actually been more than 25 years across academy and industry, 
Uh, he has a PhD in molecular and cellular biology. Um, and he has uh, been focused in uh, studying regulation of protein synthesis and, and other um, aspects of different diseases. But since uh, two, two, 2011, he concentrated in understanding the risks for disease with uh, another virus, uh, the human papilloma virus, uh, and in developing a vaccine uh, for this for this virus. Um, now, uh, Janssen, that is a, a, a pharmaceutical of Johnson & Johnson, um, uh, has been um, uh, uh, with a great uh, generosity uh, that uh, has selected uh, Dr. Jer Shepard to share with us um, the um, results or whatever they can uh, uh, information, whatever information they can pass to us, we know that this is now very, uh, very, very critical and 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 and, and, uh, and with a lot of, of 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 competition. Actually, there are three three other. Well, actually three companies uh, uh, with Johnson & Johnson uh, uh, competing uh, for the, maybe the first uh, 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 clinical trial that will provide information on the, on the, on, on the um, uh, efficacy of, of the vaccine. So um, we don't have words just to to, to thank uh, Johnson and Johnson and Johnson uh, to, to share with us uh, the information that they have. And just to say that two Spanish hospitals, uh, Hospital La Paz and, and Hospital de Paldecilla, uh, they are already participating in, 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 in those trials. And, uh, and we also, the Gregorio Marañón, will be very happy to participate <laughs> in, in those trials in the, in the future. So we wish them the, the best of luck. And, and let's uh, hear to Jerry Shepard uh, to see what he has to say. Yes. Yeah. Then the Dr. Shepard, yeah, can you, it should be in English. On the lower part of the screen, yeah. can I you see right next to reactions and record, there's, there's yeah. the language option. Yeah, it's on English now. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, a cross-functional team uh, with a CMC regulatory, clinical, preclinical, all the different functions that need to come together to produce a vaccine. Um, and as a note, our work is uh, co-funded by uh, the US government. So on the next slide, can I do that myself? Yes. Oh, uh, can I go back? Uh, ah, OK. Just, you don't have to read the whole slide. It's just an, an indication where we started uh, with the vaccine is based on a target product profile. So this is the characteristics that we would like. And in this case, it was uh, provided by the WHO. What should a vaccine for SARS-CoV-2 look like? Uh, and you can see there is a preferred and a critical minimal uh, range. And, and some of the things have already been addressed by uh, Dr. Uh, of the speakers uh, before me, 
you, you can have a vaccine that's 50% efficacy, has 50% efficacy just to, to really get going for the pandemic. Of course, you would love to have a vaccine that's much more, uh, has had better efficacy. Uh, vaccines always need to be safe. You give it to healthy people. So safety is the utmost uh, importance in everything that we're doing. Uh, two doses could be possible. Of course, one dose would be great if that gives durable protection. Uh, and, and so all these aspects we have taken into account when we started designing our vaccine. Uh, already also mentioned, there are several companies uh, trying, uh, working on, on the vaccines. Uh, some, and this is just a few, but, but has some of the major players where some are in, in phase one, phase one, two, and moving into phase three or already in phase three, uh, as you can see from Moderna, AstraZeneca, um, and Pfizer is doing a phase two, three, actually. We have started a uh, phase one, two study uh, in the end of July. We have the first uh, interim data, which I, unfortunately I cannot share yet, uh, but uh, we are planning to move very quickly to phase three, uh, for which you will see announcement uh, very soon. Um, so this is just to give you an overview of how quickly things are going. So our activity started with uh, a, an, an, an promise from uh, Paul Stoffels, who is the vice chairman uh, of Johnson & Johnson. Um, that is, we are aimed to rapidly produce and supply a safe and effective vaccine globally. So this has triggered uh, our efforts which started, as you can imagine, in January 2020, when the virus sequence was uh, published. We started with our vaccine development, uh, producing different variants, uh, first as DNA construct, but then quickly as adeno-based vaccines of different variants, which we tested in different ways. And I'll mention a little bit about that um, to actually select our lead candidate. So this was late March, and we could now call it at 26 cov 2 s for at 26 based vaccine for coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2 based on the S protein, the spike protein. And as I mentioned, we uh, started uh, clinical development late July and uh, have seen the first interim data and, and uh, the phase three trial assemble, as you see, uh, to start in September. And then we hope to be able to produce the, the or actually have the first large vaccine batches uh, available from in Q1 2021. Uh, because it's nice to have a, an effective vaccine, but everyone wants it. So you, we already started large scale manufacturing uh, process. Uh, almost as soon as we started the whole uh, discovery work. So that's the unprecedented parallel research that has already been mentioned by one of the, the previous speakers as well. Um, so this is our uh, commitment and, and there's three very uh, different parts to, to uh, where we are now after only seven, eight months into the project. That is the dedication. So uh, on the picture, that's Alex Gorski, who is the CEO of Johnson & Johnson. But the amount of people that are, have been working or are working on a project is, is in the order of a thousand already. And we get the highest priority in anything we're doing. Uh, it, it's absolutely amazing. And the dedication of the people, it, it's so many people are working day and night uh, to get this done. We built our vaccine on platform technology, so we have a lot of experience with at 20 based uh, vaccines, which I'll, I'll mention in a moment. And we have many collaborations and, and uh, both academically, but also helped with the uh, support of the US government and, and reaching out to all the health authorities, etc. We are rapidly advancing our vaccine uh, uh, in, in the clinical pr process. So as mentioned, we base our vaccine on, on two platform technologies. And one important part is the EdVec platform. So we, our vaccine is based on a replication incompetent adenovirus type 26, 
Adenovirus is, is normally causes common colds, but uh, replication incompetence cannot cause any disease, but it's, it's the carrier, uh, the vector to, to uh, express the, the spike protein. And we, from different programs in, in, in uh, different uh, viral infections, especially HIV and Ebola and, and uh, RSV, we, we have seen this will induce robust and durable immune responses both humoral uh, uh, antibody responses with, with neutralizing uh, uh, properties, but also ad additional uh, features of, of t uh, antibodies. And also we see uh, in general strong CD4 and CD8 T cell responses, which have a Th1 signature, which again is important uh, to, to minimize the risk of, of potential uh, vaccine-enhanced uh, uh, respiratory disease. So we have actually quite extensive clinical experience with the vaccines. So over 110,000 subjects have now been vaccinated. A large part of that uh, 110 is from our Ebola vaccine, which was uh, approved by EMA uh in july this year so we do have an approved uh vaccine based on the at 26 uh, platform we produce our at 26 is on the percy 6 cell line which you i think you all know hec 293s or most of you will know hec 293s percy 6 is a similar cell line but it can be grow at very high cell density serum free which gives us very high yields with a relatively small footprint one other product is already marketed. Uh, it's actually a recombinant protein that's grown on Percy 6. And more recently, we have created a new version of the Percy 6, which uh, expresses a, a, repress a repressor to improve manufacturing yields. Uh, so the combination of these two uh, is what we use. Uh, how we do that is, is by taking the genetic information of uh, the spike protein, clone that into uh, at 26 and actually we created multiple candidates. We actually created 10 different candidates with different variations of the spike protein, different signal peptides, stabilizing mutation, furin cleavage site mutations, etc. cetera. Uh, and that led to the selection of our lead candidate. This is the uh, spike protein. And as I mentioned, uh, we used a wild type or a TPA sequence as signal peptides. Uh, we used uh, stabilizing mutations uh, to uh, maintain the prefusion uh, conformation and uh, uh, also knocked out the furin cleavage site. And we also created one soluble version uh, and all with the uh, purpose to improve antigenicity and manufacturability. So, with those different prototypes, we went into preclinical testing in different species, and we did indeed mice, hamsters, uh, rabbits, and monkeys now. Uh, at the same time, we decided let's start manufacturing at large scale or towards large scale. Uh, we already have a facility in Leiden in the Netherlands that uh, we've used to produce uh, RSV and HIV clinical batches at 900 liters. So we already have experience with uh, upscaling to, to about a thousand liters, which could give us 10 to 15 million doses of the vaccine per run. So we're, we have substantial experience already with, with large scale manufacturing. So these are some uh, data of the vaccine and in green, it's now called SPP, but that's actually our lead candidate. And it shows you if you immunize uh, monkeys with a single uh, immunization with one times 10 to the 11th virus particles, and you look at uh, humoral responses after four weeks, you can uh, see in the green box that our candidate induces a uh, good ELISA titers, so uh, S binding uh, antibodies, and in two different types of neutralizing antibody assays, either pseudovirus or the wild type, this particular candidate induces the highest uh, neutralizing antibody responses. So this is one of the pieces of data uh, on which we selected this candidate. Uh, when you immunize these animals with these different candidates, and then actually after six weeks, challenge them 
with a SARS-CoV-2 cell challenge. And it's a bit uh, how it's written here on top of the slide is, is uh, a, a bit confusing, but it's, it correlates to one times 10 to the five, fifth TCID 50s, intranasal and intratracheal. And then if you look at uh, how much a virus replicates, uh, either in the lungs or in the nose, so either bell or nasal swabs, you can see that with the vaccine candidate, there is no measurable uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, in the lungs, while some of the other candidates show uh, some uh, uh, replication of the virus. And in the sham, you can see a large group where all animals uh, show uh, viral loads. And then, then we look in the nose, we see a similar picture. Again, all the sham animals have uh, high uh, copy numbers of uh, subgenomic mRNA, while in our vaccine, with our vaccine candidate, five out of the six animals have no measurable uh, virus, and there's one breakthrough animal which has, seems to have a low level of uh, SARS CoV 2 in, in the nose. So, uh, clear signs of protection after a single shot uh, with the vaccine. Um, you can also correlate that, uh, so we do actually see uh, that our neutralizing antibody titers are correlate with protective efficacy in non human primates, which is also important uh, for further studies where we try to look at, at uh, covalescent sera or, or eventually sera from uh, immunized uh, people, how we can correlate that with potential protection. And you can also see that our vaccine candidate in this uh, pseudovirus uh, neutralizing antibody uh, assay produced titers that were as good or a higher as uh, from monkeys that recovered from a SARS-CoV-2 challenge or from uh, people that recovered from COVID-19. There's always one good thing to keep in mind when you see these pictures. This depends very much on what kind of panel of human covalescent sera you, you, you take, have these, are these people, did they have severe, did they have moderate disease, did they have mild disease, is this taken three weeks after the disease or maybe two, three months? So I, I think you should, should, should see this, that our uh, candidate induces levels at least similar or maybe better than uh, what you see in, in uh, covalescent human sera. We also do uh, experiments in uh, Syrian hamsters where you can actually see more disease because uh, the, the, the monkeys show very little clinical symptoms. While if you do this in Syrian hamsters, uh, they will uh, show a lot of weight loss. And you can see here that the animals that got a mock uh, immunization and were then challenged uh, with a high dose of a virus. They lose weight, and actually, several animals had to be uh, euthanized uh, because it's a humane endpoint. And then the others will actually recover. While at two different doses of our vaccine, 10 to the 9th to 10 to the 10th, we see hardly any weight loss in these animals. Uh, and then the blue, uh, sorry, the black and red are, are an, a different type of, uh, one, of one, one of our vaccine uh, variants. So again, showing protection against disease. When we look at uh, uh, histopathology uh, of the uh, uh, of the lungs, you can uh, see that there's a, a clear difference in H and E staining in morphology of the cells, and you can also uh, see that the staining of the SARS-CoV-2 N protein. Uh, of CD3 uh, T cells and also EBA1, which is a macrophage uh, marker, which are all completely absent from our immunized animals. So we see no signs of infection. And also very important, we see no uh, signs of enhanced respiratory tract pathology in any of these animals. So where are we now? Um, uh, we, we've started a phase one study, in, which was started in the Belgium and US. We have started a phase two, two study, uh, also already mentioned, which is actually happening in Spain, Germany, and the Netherlands. 
This is a study where we uh, study different dose levels as well as different intervals because we are testing both a one dose and, and, and a two dose regimens. And uh, as you can see, we're uh, ready for this large phase three uh, ensemble study, uh, which will take place in the US, South Africa, and several Latin American countries. And the basis for these countries is really incidence and projected incidence where we'll, uh, we see the highest levels of uh, disease within the next few weeks. And, and Within those countries, we have, we have a large group of epidemiologists and data scientists uh, colleagues that are looking within those countries, where are the hotspots? And even within those regions, we look at where are sites, clinical sites that have, uh, are, are in, in population with high diverse backgrounds, just to make sure that we, uh, what we uh, recruit, who we recruit in the study, uh, gives a good reflection of, of the uh, population. And we're actually planning a second large phase three. So in this first phase three efficacy study called Ensemble, we'll start test a single dose regimen, and then in the phase three efficacy study Horizon, where uh, the the countries uh, to be included are still under discussion. Uh, we'll test a two-dose regimen for efficacy. And, and the current planning is that the ensemble study will have about 60,000 people and the horizon about 30,000. So very large studies. And already, as mentioned uh, here in green at the bottom, in the same time, we're gearing up uh, to make sure we have large-scale manufacturing and, and already large uh, quantities of vaccine uh, available in case we find the signal of efficacy uh, for a per, uh, possible emergency use or conditional uh, market authorization in, in the European Union. So this is the phase one, two study, just very quickly. Uh, we're testing one or two doses as, as indicated on the top in uh, both uh, 18 to 55 year olds and over 65 year olds. Uh, this study is fully enrolled uh, and, and uh, we're uh, generating the data post dose one and actually immunization with the second dose is ongoing in the, in the younger cohort. Uh, this is the phase two that I mentioned in the Netherlands, Germany and Spain and without going into too much detail, it tests different dose levels as you can see in, in groups one, two and three, you see it go down. We test both two dose and one dose and we're also testing intervals of four weeks, which is group seven, or three months, which is group nine. And then we're all giving most of these a very low dose at the end of the study to mimic an anamnestic response, uh, just to see if, if our uh, vaccine also induces a, a memory T cell response. Uh, this is the phase three, what I already mentioned, uh, up to 60,000 people a single uh, intermuscular dose uh, with the main readout uh, prevention of disease in people with a zero negative status as baseline. And let me see. In the meantime, we're also already uh, interacting with many countries, many uh, organizations about uh, making our vaccine uh, available for globally. So we have agreements in place with uh, the, the US. Uh, we're in, in conversation with the European Commission, with the UK, but also with several other countries have shown their interest, um, and, uh, uh, which is, which is uh, mentioned on, on the, the right-hand side of the slide. And then to acknowledge at the end, to summarize, this has been a really an, an amazing effort. I, well, everyone will tell you, uh, no one has ever seen anything like it uh, within the company, outside the company. On the challenging conditions, because you don't have all the data, you have to take decisions based on, on well, sometimes gut feeling, I would almost say. Uh, but everyone, and, and every time there is something that, that happens and, and you think, how are we going to solve this? Just to give you one example, we are actually flying samples, but also vaccine, with the J&J &J corporate jets 
and, and one box that had uh, vials could not fit into the J&J jet. So at the uh, airport, they had to write an SOP, how to open the carton box, how to enter the, uh, the cooled box into the, into the jet and how to store it. So crazy things are happening that, that uh, uh, need to be solved, but uh, it, every time uh, it, it, it happens. Uh, so maybe it's a very uh, appropriate quote that uh, from Albert Einstein, only those who attempt the absurd can achieve the impossible. So with that, I would like to thank you for your uh, attention. Okay. Uh, uh, hello? Hello? Hello. Oh. We can hear you, Eduardo. We can hear you. You can or you cannot? No, we yes, can. can. Ah, you yes, can. Hearing you. Okay. So, I, I, uh, to the organizers, please, could you just check if Dr. Clifford Lane is uh, connected? Yes, he yes. is. Okay. So, uh, welcome him, please. Okay, so now we will go to, towards the end of our presentation today. We're going to listen uh, to Dr. Clifford Lane and the closing remarks in a small debate. And finally, Professor Fernandez Cruz will conclude with his final thoughts on where the massive pandemic response efforts are going from here. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. hey, well, thank you. It's nice to come back. It was nice to enjoy uh, all the talks uh, from the session. Um, I think my role at the moment is to try to put forward a few provocative questions uh, to let this panel talk about. So I might start with one question uh, related to um, the issue of reinfection. And I know we, there was a question from um, one of the people in the audience um, for Dr. Garcia Sastre. Any thoughts? about how problems with reinfection may challenge vaccine development? Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. Um, I guess a, a broad way how to look at this question is whether we can learn from natural immunity after viral infection with, an, with the normal virus, what type of immunity is the one that is responsible for preventing reinfection, for preventing disease, and, uh, and, um, and for how long? it will last, and whether this can uh, teach us what type of immunity then we need in terms of the vaccines to, to induce, knowing what, what is the result with uh, natural immunity. And of course, the challenge is if natural immunity is unable to induce protective immunity, that, that supposes a challenge for the vaccine development because not even infection with, with, the, with the virus will be able to develop protective immunity. Now, there is always going to be reinfections, um, either by vaccines, uh, vaccinated people, even if vaccines work well, because they're never going to be an absolute, and the same thing with natural infections. The question is, how frequent these reinfections are, and what are the consequences of reinfections in someone that is uh, previously immune? And this one, we have still very little data. In terms of frequency, it looks like reinfections after natural infection can happen, but they are infrequent. So that's, that's, that's a good, uh, that's good news. What makes people that have reinfections especially vulnerable to reinfections versus people that don't? This we don't know yet. And uh, for how long immunity, natural pro protection with the virus is able to maintain protection with this also with we don't know yet. And also in these respects, we need to have in mind that what we are asking mainly now to the vaccines to do is to protect from severe consequences of infection. It might be possible that some of the vaccines that are under development that are not able to provide a sterile immunity, meaning mm -hmm. protection absolutely from infection, but as far as they're able to protect from severe disease. Mm -hmm. And if in addition, they're able to protect for the time that the person that becomes now infected with immunity is contagious, then they will do the, the already a very good job in terms of, of containing this, this disease. And again, we need, still need to learn from natural immunity what are the, the main determinants of protection and uh, for how long protection lasts. Mm -hmm. No, thank you. Please, go ahead. Yes. Yeah, a related question I have is 
we are learning that after natural infection, very often the immune response that is induced is non, non-lasting one, particularly the antibodies, they can disappear in two or three months. This is after natural infection. My question is whether when we vaccinate people with the, for instance, Janssen and Janssen vaccine, is it happening the same time, the same thing, or we are lucky and after vaccination is not the same that after infection, in the sense that the, the, the immune response induced with adenovirus 26 is long lasting more than in the natural infection. I don't know whether any of you have any answer for this. If, if, I, if I can try. Um, so I, I think a natural infection definitely can be different than, than either an ad 26 or an RNA. And that is because viruses always come with all these extra mechanisms to suppress or evade uh, the immune response. And, and our ad 26 as a replication incompetent uh, virus does not bring all these uh, effects or an RNA would not uh, lead to, to immune evasion or immune suppression. So a vaccine can definitely be different um, from, from natural infection. Um, to your question, will it be RN26 or will it be an RNA or will it be one of the others? I think everything is going so quickly. Uh, we have one month's data, I would say, and, and, and Moderna and, 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 and Pfizer may have two or three months data, but uh, no one knows yet what the durability of the responses will be at this moment, I think. Yeah. Maybe to follow up on that, though, do you have data from other um, recombinant AD26 vaccines where you've been able to look at the duration, let's say, of antibody response uh, to the insert? Yeah, so we see in, in general a an, 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 an relatively quick increase in the response in, in, in about four weeks, which then, but yeah, is maintained, sometimes dependent a little bit on the dose, for six months, maybe up to a year, the, the big question that no one also knows is how much is enough? Do you need a neutralizing antibody of 10? Do you need it of 100? Or, or do we need to be above 1,000? And, and that's going to be the most important question for all, all the vaccine developers, not only for us. Mm-hmm. I mean, with that, do you anticipate that it probably will not be a one shot takes care of you for the rest of your life? But like influenza, you may need boosts every year. I, I think I would, I would be surprised if it's truly a one shot that will protect you for life. Uh, of course, we would, that would be great. Whether we need a yearly boost like an in influenza, I don't think so. Because I don't think you might need it if the antibodies wane quickly, but you don't need it to anticipate the, the changes. Like in, in influenza, you need that new boost every year because the virus changes so quickly. I don't think there's real indication that SARS-CoV-2 would change that quickly. Uh, but there, there's coronavirus experts on the, on the call that can answer better the, the questions on, on uh, genetic changes in the virus. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Eduardo, you had a question, I think. Please go ahead. Yes. Uh, I have a question for you and uh, also for uh, Gary. Uh, It's related. So uh, we have uh, many vaccines, but let's talk about those ones that now they are competing for being the first one. Uh, But they have different designs. And uh, this is for you, Cliff. Is that we might need need different vaccines for different regions of the world because we might think that the virus uh, is my my the dynamic of, of the epidemiology of the virus has shown that it's different in different regions uh, and the rate of infections. Uh, and, and the way that the, the, they even uh, has been uh, uh, with uh, um, in, in terms of uh, of controlling 
um, in, in different parts of the world. This means that uh, we might need several vaccines for different regions of the world. And for Gary, Gary, Gary uh, is that because it's related. And, and so you can you can share the question. Uh, um, you are trying your vaccine in different parts of the world, very different, very different. Even in Europe, very different. Spain with Netherlands has nothing to do, okay? And also you use South Africa and also you use uh, United States and also you use Latin America. Is that you expect different responses also? And this will be related with the first part of the question. Yeah, well, to, to, to your question, uh, will we need already now, or maybe in the long run, different variants because uh, genetic changes in the virus? Yeah, that's possible. Uh, just by chance, the hamster experiment I showed has out of my head the aspartate 614 while the uh, the uh, non-human primate study has, has glycine at 614, so that's the, the most debated uh, change, the 614G. So we actually tested both by, by chance, actually. We're not testing many different uh, at the moment. Then again, I think the spike protein is relatively well conserved, so... Uh, over time, we, there might need to be changes, but for the moment, we assume that, that the spike protein is conserved enough for, to, to induce the responses that we're looking for across the world. And I'll take the part where you asked uh, geographic, perhaps separate from changes in the virus. I mean, certainly different populations may have different backgrounds of just general immune activation. They may have different backgrounds of exposure to different viruses or cross-reacting antigens. So it certainly is feasible that one platform may actually work better in one population than another. I, I, I do fully think that we need more than one vaccine because I don't think any one company is in a position to make the quantity of vaccines that we need to achieve global immunization. And there's certainly, I would have a hope, it may be an aspirational goal, I may go with that Einstein saying on the last slide, that if we could do some very large trials, we might be able to put the different candidates into randomization and see uh, how they perform um, in different settings so we could be more um, evidence-driven in, in what we do. So that's a sneaky thing, though, to ask the moderator a question. It, it makes it very <laughs> difficult uh, to moderate. But I have a question, Dr. Lane, I have a question related to just last statement. When you mentioned the cross-reactivity that we can have with antigens, and particularly depending upon the immune reaction of that population, mm -hmm. uh, on the streets is a very good question as a health policy to this year, coming winter, we have to vaccine ourselves against that so-class so class coronavirus, the flu, the pneumonia. Is that the case? I mean, do you all agree that that will be an advisable thing to do from clinical standpoint of view to prevent the pandemic? So the question, should we make any changes in influenza vaccination? Right. Yes. I I'd throw it to the panel. Maybe... Um, Anyone want to take that? Adolfo. <laughs> well, I can, I can take that. Actually, influenza vaccination uh, recommendations are different between different countries. Um, so in the United States, um, it's recommended for uh, everybody, basically since um, six months old till, uh, till the elderly. Uh, in other countries, it's recommended only to what is so-called risk groups. Uh, which sometimes they make almost 50% of the population, but, and also um, vaccination rates are different according to different countries. Um, in any case, um, I think it's, uh, it's advisable to vaccinate against influenza, not only because of this pandemic, I, that's always has been, I always have been supported to increase influenza vaccination rates 
because although it's a vaccine that is not a perfect vaccine, still there is good evidence that it saves lives. And therefore, the more vaccination there is, the more lives we can save against influenza itself. Now, in this now pandemic, vaccination against flu and prevention of flu infections can also help in diminishing the rate in which people require to be, or the number of people that requires hospitalization, because we are reducing the people that are flu infected. We have symptoms in the beginning, very similar to the COVID-19, and even some severe infections can also symptoms that are very similar to COVID-19. So I think we are helping also to the management of the pandemic. Having said that, also one needs to have in mind that the um, measures that are being taken in, in many places to prevent um, the number of infections with COVID-19, meaning social distancing, use of masks, um, in some places, uh, the closing of the schools. This also is gonna uh, result in a reduction in the number of flu infections, because the same techniques that have been used to prevent infections with COVID-19 are gonna prevent infection with influenza. So we will expect a, a flu season that is milder because of these measurements that have been taken with more or less um, effects in, 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 but taken almost everywhere. In fact, in the South Hemisphere, there is almost, there has not been in the winter, almost any case of flu infection, and mainly has been this due because the schools have been closed, there was distant social distancing caused by COVID-19. But again, my recommendation or what I think it should be done is increase the rate of, vac of flu vaccination as much as possible. First, because flu can cause also severe disease, and second, to reduce the number of people that requires hospitalization due to influenza infection. And I certainly would agree with that, said Eduardo. Yes, it's, it's, it's just uh, to support uh, this idea of, of vaccination, not only the vulnerable, uh, population, but uh, in general, uh, we know especially that uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, with uh, comorbidities is uh, uh, exacerbates uh, the risk of, uh, of, of not only morbidity, mortality. Uh, so um, um, it, it will be uh, uh, necessary to have the, the population uh, immunized against, against influenza. Uh, and as I say, not only vulnerable, but uh, just most of the, uh, of the population. Also, other uh, kind of vaccines, like for example, uh, for pneumonia, eh? the, uh, uh, that, that also in patients vulnerable uh, with uh, some diseases, uh, pulmonary diseases and so on, will be good to have immunized uh, with the pneumonic, uh, pneumonia vaccines. And uh, so to extend the immunity against the different pathogens with the vaccines that we are available uh, is something advisable in the presence of uh, this uh, pandemic virus. But not any of you answered the question because the question was related to the cross reactivity. And then that will be a sort of a blind immune response from our human being when it's confronted with the pandemic. And uh, I guess yeah. uh, that is I, not clear. I guess it's not clear. I mean, yeah, I guess I guess I can take that. I mean, we need we need to distinguish between two types of cross reactivity. Uh, one will be cross reactivity that is due to cross reactive adaptive immune responses, mm -hmm. which is people that have been previously exposed to the coronavirus. They may have antibody epitopes uh, recognized by antibodies, B cell memory, as well as recognized by CTLs that are common with the SARS coronavirus two and they are not directed against the most uh, targeted region of SARS coronavirus 2, which is the receptor binding domain, which is, uh, is the one that um, most of the vaccines try to target in order to prevent binding to the receptor. And this may have, may skew the immune response that we get against um, non-neutralizing epitopes, perhaps. On the other hand, we can get the, the, the opposite effect that this pre-existing immunity helps already to prevent some 
infection or some levels of severe disease, replication of SARS coronavirus 2. So we don't know exactly where the pre existing immunity that is cross reactive adaptive mm -hmm. against other coronavirus is going to lay in terms of, of, of the, this thing. We don't know yet. But there is another way I think that you are referring to, to cross protection, which is what is called now term train immunity which is, uh, you know, we have been, uh, there have been debates about whether even BCG vaccination may contribute to uh, protection against SARS coronavirus infection. I think this is more debatable at this moment. I think it's clear train immunity exists. It's mainly due to innate immune responses that have been uh, enhanced, that are cross-reactive then between different pathogens. But for how long this innate enhancement according to different infections or different vaccination regimens, um, they actually work against completely more heterologous things. Uh, like, does an influenza virus infection prevent you from COVID infection for perhaps well, two months because of an enhancing innate immunity? That's something that we don't know for sure, but it's likely to contribute less than what is cross-protection due to adaptive immune response. And why I say that? I say that because obviously we are infected by a lot of things and still we are continuing being infected by a lot of things. So they may help, but how much they help and for how long is something that we still uh, have not clear. Okay. Uh, at least that's my opinion. A very short question to, to Gert. This is almost, a, uh, it looks like a technical question. Is you clearly stated that those are adenoviruses they have engineered to remove genes so they cannot propagate, they cannot replicate. Yeah. But the point is, they assume, I assume that they still can make messenger RNAs encoding different proteins. Do yeah, absolutely. Yes. So, so they are. Type of infection. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so they are the carrier for the genetic material. So from in that perspective, they they are are similar to an, an RNA VLP, uh, although because it's the virus also expressing some of its other proteins, it comes with a lot of different adjuvant adjuvating activities that normally come with a normal infection, but but it's replication incompetent. And, and for how long they can still make messenger RNAs on the site of infection? Ooh, that's a detailed yeah. question. I think it's it's for for days to weeks, uh, but then you can no longer find the actual uh, virus. Okay. Have you considered intranasal immunization? Because we know the route to induce mucosal immunity in the respiratory tract is 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 to immunize in the respiratory tract, IN or whatever. Yeah. And in yeah. fact, other company has tried both routes the intramuscular and intranasal, and they were quite surprised. I don't know why they were so surprised that by using IM, they induce a strong uh, respiratory immunity. And you think it's because the prones that might be derived from the regulatory agencies, if we you administrate the virus IM? Yeah, so I th we're testing some of these uh, uh, different uh, administration pathways in, in, in preclinical models and, and especially in, in, in my other program, which is a therapeutic HPV vaccine. We have, we have also looked with, with John Schiller at, at uh, uh, intervaginal, for example, indeed for this particular method to, to, to get mucosal immunity. I think for the adenoviruses, uh, there has been one or two reports when you do high level at five, which is a different factor, there might be reason to believe, but I don't know the data exactly that it will actually uh, uh, get into the, the nervous system if you do it intranasal. So I, there, I, there's definitely hesitancy, hesitancy to do this uh, without the proper preclinical models uh, in, in humans. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Adolfo. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, hopefully, um, Dr. Sepper can, uh, can give us his opinion. Um, uh, and I understand it's not a fair question for you, but I would like to know your opinion. So there are uh, multiple adenoviruses that can be used as vaccine vectors. Mm -hmm. And there has been, uh, you know, debates about how much levels of pre-existing immunity are or not 
able to prevent vaccine efficacy. And for AT5 also, there has been this HIV vaccine trial where it seemed, it seemed, I think it was not completely proven, but it seemed that a recall of a response with AT5 may actually increase the risks to being HIV infected. Yeah. And I wondered uh, to what extent between people that are using adenoviruses, this type of questions have uh, made an impact or not in whether a specific adenovirus vector may be more suitable for vaccination than other. Yeah, definitely. So, so the original choice for at 26 came from prevalence studies. So at 26 uh, has relatively low prevalence in, let's say, uh, the Western world. Uh, it's, it's more prevalent in, in, in uh, Africa, for example. Uh, nevertheless, uh, important to realize is at 26 uses a different uh, receptor uh, for binding. And in our clinical studies that we have seen so far, we have seen little effect or hardly any effect from pre-existing immunity. So where at five pre-existing immunity very clearly reduces the immune response that you get after vaccination with an at five based factor. Um, then the other, we actually have an, a very large or large 2300 subject HIV trial running in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa uh, in 2,300 women, uh, and 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 um, and again, it, it's I'm not the complete expert, but uh, that we have never seen any indication that at 26 based vaccines would uh, lead to the similar kind of increased sensitivity of uh, for HIV infections as, as has been reported in the TIE trial for uh, HIV. Um, whether that's how that is for the chimp adenos, I really don't know uh, which uh, AstraZeneca is using. Yeah. Dear friend, we are really, okay, Edward, you wanna say something? That, that's that's a, main, a, a, a short one. one. Go okay. ahead. And, 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 and first I ask permission. Uh, Clifford, would you allow me to ask in the name of the audience uh, when an effective vaccine will be available? It, 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 it depends on, on three, four factors. Is there high incidence where we or AstraZeneca or where the people do their phase three trials? Uh, and, and that's a, 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 a matter of mathematics. It depends on recruitment rates, if you recruit within a few weeks or you take six months to recruit your full study. The trial size, do you do 30,000, 50,000, 60,000, makes a big difference. And the vaccine efficacy. So the higher the efficacy, the earlier you can actually uh, look at is there a difference between my placebo arm and my active arm. Realistically now, speaking, I think from what the people have been doing and, and where they are in the study, I think Pfizer, Moderna could have, if they have a really effective vaccine, they did immunize uh, 10 to 1,000, and maybe AstraZeneca as well, they could have a signal of efficacy if they have very high in the November time frame, I would say. But that's if everything comes together. More realistically, I think we should see uh, good signs of efficacy in the uh, very late 2020, early 2021 uh, uh, time. Uh, I, I think that that is anything before December would be great. December would be very good. January is probably gen late December, January. You would expect those large trials of, of the other developers and maybe our, even our own to see the signals of efficacy. And can we have the opinion of the director? So, I think Eduardo, I think you're giving me a loaded question. Uh, however, I will not shy away from it. So um, what I would say is that I think we will have an effective vaccine, uh, but it will be in the future. <laughs> and in the words of not Einstein, but a famous New York Yankee baseball player, Yogi Berra, predictions are very difficult, especially when they involve the future. Yeah. 
Yeah, and, 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 and of course, the one aspect that then come, that would be a vaccine that has shown efficacy, then the big question comes, how quickly can one company, multiple companies produce millions or I've seen now a number of 16 billion uh, doses. So you, you, you talked a few times about competition between the big uh, pharma or between the pharma. Of course, everyone likes to be the first, but it's a very good thing where there are multiple companies trying to do it because we'll need more than one producer. Uh, uh, let's hope three, four, five make it quickly to that uh, point. Just to add to one, one comment to that, I, I showed one slide that shows it was really good that the companies have been providing their phase three protocols so they can be looked at and publicly discussed. Uh, Pfizer is looking at a slightly different set of interim analyses than what we have out there from Moderna and AstraZeneca. So if the vaccine is extraordinarily effective, one might have an earlier result as Gert had mentioned earlier. Thanks. Hey, terrific friends. I mean, I think we are ready.